well, she points out that I never tell people to like and subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. Poll results from our fans. Uh, this is me, Michael S. Collins, here with uh, my colleague, Mr. John Arnold. Hello. Uh, and remember, you can always comment on what the fans thought down below. We'll have to hear what you think. And always remember, please like and subscribe. Is the list for the 60th anniversary of the Doctor Who's themselves in order. And that is the 13 people who have played the role in regular on TV. Um, so we haven't included John Hart or two David Tennants or people who haven't been on the show yet. People who run stage or big finish only doctors, etc. etc. In 13th place, and I should stress this is just least favourite of a strong bunch, it is Jodie Whittaker. Um, oh, harsh. Yes, I feel she's she suffered a lot from the writing in her era. Uh, when she was given something to do, she ran with it, but the chances for short and few. Yeah, I mean, the character, I think the characterization wasn't particularly interesting, and it often, her, her doctor was kind of almost away from the drama of the stories. So, you know, there wasn't, didn't particularly resolve them or resolve them badly. Just writing in Doctor is that kind, that second half of Spyfall, where the, you know, the doctor, yeah, the master's got, a, a, you know, the master is not white. Send him off to the Nazis. You know, whatever you think of the master might deserve in that, it's just a bad yes. moral moment. Yeah. And, and as well as that, it's where well, you've got um, Noah and Yat Khan in that as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Weber time. We can't save her. Hang on. She, you, she just helped you. She's been great. And you're sending her off to die quite horribly. Same because when she's given stuff like Witch Finders or even stuff like Nikola Tesla, she runs with it. Good to the sort of the foil in those ones, but there's, yeah, there's a sense of fun to her in them as well, even in, in the dark adventure, which is a lovely contrast on stuff. I think they could have gone a lot darker with the drama, and she could have been this kind of bobbing light in the middle of it. I feel like she's a fun doctor who got stuck in grim stories, yes, absolutely. Number 12, Matt Smith. Wow, I really didn't expect it yes. to be that, though. I think he kind of got forgotten in the, the votes. Fan of the Matt Smith era. Uh, I, I, I took to his uh, slightly bad at reading the room, but meaning the best uh, take on the role. Of course. You know that takes so early, doesn't he, as well? Yes. Instantly. He does have one of the, the, the... He has the finest regeneration any Vulture has in my book. Standing alone on one village for 2,000 years to protect them because no one else will and slowly dying of old age. That's yeah, just... Again, both Moffat's regeneration the same, almost the same here. It's a, it's a second of reenactment. It's the Doctor fighting against the odd, being forced to stand still against those yeah. odds. The, the only thing for me is I think he settled, because he, he's still a young actor at this point, he settles on a performance very early, a reading... And it is a brilliant reading and a brilliant performance. And you know from that first episode exactly what you're getting. Still a young, energetic doctor, but some, but still different to David Tennant. You know, it's it's he really manages to distinguish himself so well. You know, that, that slightly nerdier doctor, more obvious. And again, it, you, you, it's brilliant to see them playing off each other late in the day of the doctor. It works so well. You know, it is all, almost at that kind of Trent and Pervy level. Number 11. Paul McGann. We've only got an hour of him. So unless you're voting on like the eighth Doctor Adventure books or Big Finish, <laughs> is you know, there's not that much. He does really beautifully in you know, in that kind of that first hour. He yeah. he has the right energy, he has the right presence for it, you know. That that delivery of these shoes they fit perfectly. It's oh that's gorgeous. He sells that romantic doctor, which you know, is something we haven't really quite had before. Yes. And then, you know, he comes back um, in 2013 
And again, it, it's effortless. It, it, it's just, it, I think it's almost more McGann than the Doctor we saw in yes. 1996. But it's all done kind of laconic almost, but still wanting to save the universe, still with that heart there. It's, you know, the war damaged Doctor. And he's really well done. I, you know, I, I would still have loved to have seen a series with McGann. Weird. One of the weird legacies of the Chris Chibnall era is that one minute of Paul McGann's Doctor and Power of the Doctor now has me on the bandwagon of wanting to see more of that Doctor. Totally. Just, <laughs> he's just got those. He's just got that. And it, it's McGann's wit that a scouse wit that undercuts everything. It's yeah, totally. Feels like he's about to grow into the role. Yeah. <laughs> <It's weird. laughs> yeah. Number ten is Colin Baker's favourite Doctor Who, Colin Baker. <laughs> <laughs> Colin will, will be, you know, I know he doesn't like Paul's, but he's got to be happy to be of a match. <laughs> um, Again, someone, I think, like like Jodie Whittaker, who was just badly served by Doctor Who at the time. Yes. He's almost by someone who didn't like him ha having been cast, uh, but, you know, who was intent on basically an anti-Doctor Who kind of almost. You know, it, it's a case of he didn't like writing for the lead character because he couldn't get into the lead character. He liked men in conflict, and the Doctor isn't that. So, and who really structured his series badly, you know, when you've got the... He doesn't... The, his way of restructuring the series is to go, well, we'll keep the Doctor away from the action for half a story. So it always takes the Doctor halfway. So the Doctor doesn't get a chance to be the Doctor for a lot of the stories that he's in. The rare opportunities he gets so that he could have had a far better run than he got. Uh, unfortunately, he was pretty much killed from day one with that quote and that characterization of trying to murder his own companion. Yeah, and I, I think the only writers who really find a good way to write him, I know sacrilege to them, Pip and Jane Baker. Yes. I can see why he likes them. All. Again, they write these really good straight adventure stories yes um whatever i know time of the brownie is to you know two parts but it's 90 minute adventure stories where it's fun it's almost fun being with the doctor yes and and the thing is they, they always might say they were meant to lighten up in the mysterious planet and to, i rewatched the mysterious <laughs> planet i think it was last year or the year before and they really don't there's still moments where they go where they don't do that at all where they're still sniping at each other where it's still a bit grim and grisly, and and it's just a, a pervadingly grim and horrible atmosphere. He's still pompous in it, but sometimes he smiles. Yes. <laughs> and God bless Big Finish for giving me a chance to actually deliver a rolling story that you might want to actually listen to. Uh, number nine is, you know, numero uno of them all, Mr. Arnold. Number nine. Number nine. Hugh Stevens. Without him, we don't. Again, we're not here. That he, you know, he established it. He is, you know, he, he comes across as grumpy. Again, I, I think I think Michael can relate to him quite a bit because he comes across as <laughs> grumpy old sod, but he's giggling away at the universe and <laughs> He's such a funny character. He look can... at look at the Romans. He has a ball in the Romans. Yes. Gun fighters, the myth makers. He's having a whale of a time. He's enjoying the absurdity of the universe. He's he, he's found his role. He's found a way to be a hero to kids, and he's loving it. Obviously, an adventure in space and time is a really beautiful tribute to the man. I think the best tribute I can give him is that I recently started that marathon. I'm going to go through all of Doctor. And you know how much I love the Trout and Pertly Eras Doctor Who. So do you. I am currently struggling to get into the Highlanders because having spent three years with William Hartnell, I miss the guy in the, as Doctor Who. This is I, th this will tell you how good Trout ended up being. Yes. As William Hartnell was the one person who thought Doctor Who the big success. So everyone else was saying the show will last the, the 13 episodes if we're lucky. He was going around telling people, I think this show's going to be an amazing success. I think it's going to last for five years. Even he was underestimating it. Yes. <laughs> if that shocked you, this is going to bamboozle you. 
Number eight, David Tennant. Oh. See, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with David Tennant being kind of <laughs> low. He is obviously, with, I, I think, with the mod, William Hart was a doctor in the 60s. Pertwee and then Tom Baker were huge, huge in the set in the you know in the seventies in a way that perhaps no other doctors were. And then you get to the two thousands. Eccleston made a huge impact, but you know by two thousand ten, by the time David Tennant left, no one remembered the Christopher Eccleston era. Mm-hmm. The guy is a brilliant actor. He has so much charisma, and you know I, I go back to his stories, and I generally do enjoy watching them. I think it's perhaps because, you know, as a fan, he was so omnipresent. And and it's Doctor Who at its really most populist. Human nature, one of the great Doctor performances. And you get Midnight. Again, I, I won't say he's my favourite Doctor, but those are two of my favourite ever performances by an actor playing the Doctor in any episode. It, they are magnificent, uh, spellbinding stuff. This earlier this week, or last week, and he's never been nominated for a, for a Anything. BAFTA. For a BAFTA, sorry, thank you. Never Did nominated you for a BAFTA. Come on. The good guy. Not like a hint to me. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven is someone that I know many people is actually their favourite uh, doctor. And I can understand because when he's at his best, he's great. It's just that he doesn't always get the chance to be the best. And that is uh, Peter Davison. Again, I, I think he suffers from Saywoodites here. Yes. So, again, someone writing an anti-doctor who is trying to t- take the Doctor away from the heart of the story and is interested more in other characters. But you, again, I think that he suffers from the fact he's quite a subtle actor as well. And But if you go back and you rewatch something like Warriors of the Deep, my God, he is, he saves that from being utterly unwatchable to merely unwatchable. Yes. Uh, he he's, he does try and lift everything around him. You watch him, he's adding little gestures in his and little lines, little readings, adding a bit of sarcasm and a bit of wit. He's really underrated because, you know, he was seen as kind of wet and nice. But he really isn't. He's he's really under his exasperated, funny, Again, grumpy at the world. There's a lot of heart in him as well. On that. Number six, I might let you do the reveal because it's someone you've met from the new series. What, another one? <laughs> <laughs> um, someone who grew up on the initial years of Doctor Who and had an immense fondness for, say, the web planet and Mondasian Sidemen. Yes. It's it whispering. would be quite possibly then the finest actor to actually take the part of Doctor Who, that would be Mr. Peter Capaldi. The one and only. My favourite New Who Doctor. Absolutely. I, and we are unanimous on that one. Okay, you can say maybe, did he go into it a little bit you know, dark? But then you know, once he saw the line readings, he was able to adjust it back. And a, a lot of people don't like those first two Capaldi seasons because they are so dark and I think um, Stephen Moffat as well is in a very dark place but then you get something like the exorcism of having said how many other doctors no matter how good they are could have carried that story off his last season always took different I think the first two seasons to a certain degree they get Malcolm Tucker out of his system I think they said they might have wanted Malcolm Tucker light for those first two seasons and they just got the full Malcolm Tucker to that first one, certainly. It's the first two seasons, to be honest. I think you can see him mellowing the character out as early as Mummy in season one. I think that's why it's a success, is that he was willing to change as he saw the performance to make it more Doctor Who. Yes, I think I can't remember if it was in one of his initial interviews. He wanted the Doctor to be this kind of Philosopher, poet, a kind of Leonardo da Vinci type. Um, you know. I, I don't maybe think maybe the first two seasons don't quite nail that, but that last season has it. He has it absolutely perfectly. Mm. Who's seen as you know dour and duck? My God, the guy can do comedy. You know, look at Robert's show. Look at the husbands of River Song. That is good. That whole and you know that and then it pivots. He's doing comedy for three quarters of an hour in that. 
and then just one line pivot straight to that that kind of that last thing and he sells it and that's so difficult to do plus he punched a racist yes absolutely yeah <laughs> Number five, Patrick Brown. Uh, knowing the electorate here, I think that's, I, I'm surprised how slightly low that is. Um, no, no reason, no reflection on it. He, he's gone down slightly in my estimation, but this is because I think I encountered Patrick Trang at exactly the right time because I saw, you know, it, it very, very early when I was li a new mid fan, they reran that um, the five bases of Doctor Who seasons. So I had Hartnell, I had so I, I've always had this kind of Splendid chaps, all of them, viewed to a large degree. You know, I've, I've never gone, you know, you, your first doctor should be your first doctor, you should stick to it or anything like that. And, you know, I was, um, let's see, 80 or so, seven when they were on. So, you know, you, wa you watch Crotons. The Crotons is not a great story. Patrick Trenton sells you the Crotons yes. like anything. Yes. But again, you're looking at, he's always got some bit of business, he's always got some comedy. And this is why it's kind of tragedy that his ear is kind of almost threadbare to a degree, even if, you know, we can animate it now, it's not going to capture those little moments that Trenton's giving everything. You can't animate his ability to kill fear. He's unparalleled at that. The double takes. I mean, he can make the face change. Yes. And you, you know, it's, it's like the Tomb of the Side, man. You, you think it's just, you know, it, when it first came back, it's just great serious Doctor Who. And then, oh, there's that bit of business with Jamie and the Doctor where Victoria just comes <laughs> in. Oh, Very amiable, Doctor. Yeah. Very amiable. Look, we in the, the three Doctors as well. Yes. And the, the the way they spark off each other. Oh, and, and you know, it's, you know, as, as a kid, it's the little guy up against the big, big man. And you're like, yeah, come on. So I, th I think he's absolutely... It's like a doctor we haven't talked about yet. I think it's got little that sort of magician quality to him. I think of all the doctors, classic era, he's the one who has the best chemistry with all of his companions. Absolutely. Like, just immediately you can you, you can read that they're all friends instantly. Maybe some of them aren't given the best of work, uh looking at Victoria here. You still believe in her relationship with the doctor. Totally. And that's that's kind of what gives you an added pathos the end of the war games as well. Oh. Number four. Christopher Eccleston. Oh, quite pleasingly high that. Again, one of my favourite doctors because you know, I, I can't separate him from that era, from that year where you go in Doctor Who's back just a, please be good. We, we, we might get one year out of this, might get a couple. Even, even behind the scenes, they're going, we might not get more than one year. We're going out in a blaze of glory. And my God, that season, it, you know, it, it took Doctor Who from the fringes, from the cult TV stuff, and put it right back in the heart of the mainstream where it belonged. We know that the, the, the they, they were production issues, particularly behind the scenes on the first season, which meant it didn't run smoothly. And there was a there were a lot of fallouts on that, but it all kind of played into it because you know it's a, he he didn't know how to do comedy particularly well, so he wanted to play the comic side of the role, and and the thing is, all these all these choices where he's being kind of awkward with the comedy where, and you know, and and the whole story of him connecting with the world via Rose and healing himself, yes. and I know it wasn't necessarily planned. But the regeneration is an absolutely perfect ending. It's a, it's you know, I know it's technically thirteen episodes. It's a perfect story in Doctor Who that whole season. The comedic bickering and the empty child, or sort of the pathos of Father's Day, or even like as I say, the the space pig moment. Oh we, yeah, we just looks at the hu hu human beings like you know, but and then of course. Um, how should put the cliffhanger and bad wolf? I was sitting on the set and I realized by the time that scene had finished, we were up, I was on the edge of my setting. I don't think that's Doctor Who's done that to me. Uh, there's so many great moments in what was only just about 600 minutes of TV. I mean, 
the entire Eccleston era of Doctor Who is shorter than one series of Cobra Kai. Number three, and just for interest, the top three are separated by four points. Number three is my great childhood hero, John Pertwee. I'm surprised he's that low game given our electric. I'm sure that our good friend, Mr. Paul Gill, is right <laughs> now watching this yelling, fix robbery. <laughs> You, you can't he replace you cannot replace childhood gods. <laughs> he wasn't my favourite doctor. I, I wouldn't have him this high politically, but he's a very he's very good. You go back to that era, it's the possibly the best produced consistent consistently the best produced era Doctor Who has ever had. And Purpose at the heart of it. I think what he re, re what they work out early on is he might not be the greatest actor. But he's a great performer. So he gets you, you work around his presence. John Pertwee play John Pertwee, let's yes. face it. And he's got the charisma. Yeah, you know, where and he can, you know, whether he's yelling at civil servants or again, the scenes with Trenchard in um, in the Sea Devils, some of my favorites in Doctor Who. They, you know, they, they're straight based comedy, whether you know, they don't acknowledge it, and it's so perfectly played. My comfort blanket era of Doctor Who, you know, uh, there are at least 16 or 17 of his 24 other stories that I would put at least 7 out of 10 or higher, much higher than most of them. And if I'm ever down, I'll just re immediately reach for an emergency, apparently. Uh, it's all... it's a bit crazy, isn't it? It's a, you know, I'm not as high on the Pertwee era as you and Paul are. I was like, Actually, I was going through and going. There's only like, there's only probably three that I wouldn't say are. I don't think are particularly good. That I I wouldn't happily just go. I'll just put that on, sit through that. Monster Peladon, Planet of the Spider. No Spider, sorry, Daleks, and let's see, um, mutants. I quite like the mutants. I, I rewatched that on the box. I I I I'm much more fond of it. I used to, and I loved the target as a kid. So I can't think of the third. Call me in space. I, I'd say I, I, it takes three episodes before Roger Delgado comes on board. Yes. Yeah, I've always taken is that although he's possibly the grumpiest doctor, he's also the sort of most optimistic that. He, Things will change for the better. Uh, he he'll go in there and shake hands with the monster and want to hear its side of the story and maybe try and make it everything better for everyone if he can. And you're always wanting him to succeed because he's just so positively the image of Doctor Who. What Doctor Who should be in my head? Yeah, yeah, he has that. Again, I think this is, we just talked about Eklund. He has that frustration with the human race. And that's so beautifully played. He plays that beautifully all the way through. You know, where, where it's the the angrier Doctor of season seven, where he's much less tolerant, or where he, and he becomes kind of more likable almost to a certain degree. Even though he can quite snap, the Brigadier gets a fair bit of stick from him unjustly for a lot, large. Yet yeah, again, it, it's a, it's an era you can just go back to and really just. For a comfort era, I don't think there are better. There's a better era for a comfort era than that, even if it's not particularly mine. Yeah, the feels the fan base that are voting in this because it's Tom Baker at number two. Yes, good lord, <laughs> um, great actors, but kind of none of them were really as solidly identified as the Doctor as Tom Baker was. He. You, he doesn't nail his poem straight away. You look at robot, you and you look at something like the Arc in space, say the um, you know the humanity, the you know the indomitable, and you, that's not the Fourth Doctor. That grandstanding speech, it, it's a John Pertwee speech, and Tom Baker doesn't doesn't know how to play it because it's not Tom Baker. Tom Baker wants to find the fun in lines. He wants to find something portentous, and he wants to find something exciting in there. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of grandstanding that doesn't work for his doctor. 
maybe maybe as far as Terror of the Zygons, might be in somewhere around Revenge, late um, Genesis. He finds that performance. He finds that, you know, the bo- the boggle eye, the staring at forms the charisma, you know, the I've got the big scarf and I'm gonna use it stuff. Tom Baker is the uh, he's seen as a sort of slightly goofy uncle Doctor Who type figure. But the bits I always think of him for his best bits is when he does quiet rage. Like in the private planet against the the, the captain, you know, then what's it for? Or the end of Nightmare of Eden when he just tells Lewis Fiander to go away. And he, particularly given, I think, at that but Tom Baker is in the middle of a point where he's obviously not getting the script level of script he wants or... And it's just this one moment where suddenly, where he's been overacting, you know, the infamous, my arms, my legs, my everything. Yes. And then he gets that back and he's like, oh, wow. Oh. But yeah. Hard to dislike Tom Baker because he is Doctor Who. And he is also the recipient of one of my favourite convention quotes of all time. Where Barry Letts once said that Tom Baker is the only man he knows who, as he ages, is slowly going sane. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah you know he, he's a born raconteur isn't he I, yes. I, I, I've met him a couple of times funnily enough and he's fan, He's you know he's this fantastic large he's exactly what you'd want he's exactly what you'd expect when you meet Tom Baker oh, but, but when he's on his game he's totally he, genius he has that alien thing that, and you know there's a reason that so many kids just regarded him as this absolute all-conquering hero. Yeah, you know, the, there is. You know, there is. If if you're going to sum up the role of the Doctor and what it means, there's no better thing than you know. He says the the kid who came up to him in the street and ran up to him, came up and said, "Thank you for making Saturday lights better." I had a shit life, you know. I was in an orphanage, whatever, and you just made that Saturday night made life worthwhile. Now we've got someone as wild, as yes. wonderful, as eccentric, and you know, as full of the joy of life as Tom Baker is. Yes. Star Trek fans have William Shatner, and Doctor Who fans said, hold our coat. <laughs> we've got Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Number one sums up how obvious and cliched our fan base is, and me and you by... Uh, anyway, because we agree, because uh, they've all voted number one to be Sylvester McCoy. <laughs> yes, yes, I have been waiting. Yes, <laughs> thirty-five years for this. <laughs> oh, oh yes. I, I mean, I, 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 I've probably told this many times in many places, but you know. 1987, I'd kind of been drifting away from Doctor Who, you know, even the terrible sort of Sayward era, maybe a sense that, you know, that season 24 where they don't know quite what they're doing, it's all looking cheap, wasn't for me. And then I just sit, you know, I sit down first, you know, we, we got a video recorder between seasons, so it's first to I could have, you know, of my own to rewatch. and so yeah, I sat down remember to the Daleks and, you know, I've got, it is a recognisable show, um, you know, a pre title sequence. You've got Sylvester McCoy nailed the forms. He, he's channeled that energy. And you know, by the time the Dalek is, you see the Dalek heads up display and he's giving it the good fear acting. Lifer, forget it. Nothing is ever t- tearing me away from this show. I mean, he's so good a doctor. He's, again, he's got that trained thing of being this kind of little magician that way. He can't particularly do anger well. That that's no problem. You don't give him anger. You give him a bit of mystery, a bit of something energy, something very human to play. You know, the way he plays the scenes with Ray in um, Delta and the Bannermen, for instance, you know, with with Flower Child and Bellboy in the Great Show in the Galaxy. Oh, he's you know, been a favourite of mine since I was eight years old. Uh, I cannot lie. I'm delighted that he's a lot more kindly thought of. Than- fandom these days than he was <laughs> so is it yeah you know, so i would I, I can't claim to go back as far as eight because i wasn't <laughs> it wasn't he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't so. yes. 
but he kind of he just embodies the kind of magic of the doctor for me you, you know, even in those kind of that last kind of slightly darker season he's still having fun he's still this kind of impish presence behind the scenes where you where you almost forgive him <laughs> the the manipulative stuff because he's that good and he understood the role so well like he makes a like they in remembrance there's a bit with the doctor who's going to shoot someone with a gun and he's like no that's not the doctor and he changed it to make it more doctory he got where the role should be in a way Sauer never did totally I, I think didn't he base it on was it based on his grand I think he, yes. his grand made it to a hundred yeah yes. which, made it to a hundred they said I've had enough whack <laughs> and then knocked down that sense of a long life and melancholy and that's that's I think that's really what's at the heart of that doctor that makes it great. That underlying melancholy of the centuries and the energy. Yes. And you get stuff like um you know, I've been listening um a lot obviously to Toby Hedoki's hey no, sorry, I don't sorry, sorry, Toby, I don't want to mispronounce your surname again. Listen to his time travel thing again, and they've just done remembrance of the Daleks. And as as I was reminded. That speech with Joseph Marcel, you know, Jeffrey the Butler from the French Prince of Bel Air in the cafe. I could watch that endlessly. It's such a beautiful thing and it just sums up Doctor Who when and, he, comes with, and Doc's point of view. But a he, great Doctor. Uh, yeah, again, I say he's a magic show for me. And again, in real life, yes. exactly as you hope he is on screen. Oh. oh, brilliant! I I have to I have to praise the discerning choice of our electorate. <laughs> well, that's the Doctor Who's for us uh, and you. Uh, feel free to comment below and remember to like and subscribe. Thank you.